So thanks again, everyone, for being here today. Um, we are very happy to have one of our own uh, speaking to, to us today, Christina Fiddler. And Christine um, will introduce her. Yes, hi. We are totally delighted to have Christina give us this talk today on uh, the Born Digital Archives here at Bancroft. Christina Velasquez Fiddler is the digital archivist here at UC Berkeley at the Bancroft Library. She manages this she manages the maintenance and stewardship of our Born Digital Collections, Born Digital Archival Collections. She received her bachelor's degree in English at Humboldt State University in 2005. Her MLIS from San Jose State University in 2010, and has been working in the archives profession for over 10 years. She has previous work experience as a software implementation consultant, an archives assistant at the California Academy of Sciences, and is the archivist at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology here at UC Berkeley. And here's a fun fact that I did not know, and many of you may not know this either. Christina plays the tuba with her favorite being the four valve rotary euphoniums. During the shelter in place, she started taking piano lessons to fulfill a childhood wish. And she once drove a cable car down Hyde Street in San Francisco. Feel free to ask her about these things at the end of her talk. <laughs> <laughs> and without further ado, Christina, please take it away. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share about this work. And uh, I'm just thrilled that people want to hear about it. So welcome to this talk. Uh, I want to first, I want to thank my student, Sophia Hernandez, who helped me um, create this slide. We took a lot of these very cool photographs, and she was um, very savvy at this. So a big shout out to my student, Sophia Hernandez. Um, so welcome again. Uh, I'm going to briefly go over what I'm going to talk about today uh, before I really get going. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about the Neil Marcus papers. And I think by starting off by going over a collection, it'll give us this background and this kind of uh, example to work from. I'm going to talk about our whole program, what we do, and by having the Neil Marcus papers in your mind, I think it'll make it more tangible. So again, after we talk about Neil Marcus, I'll deep dive into the actual program. I think it's really important that we uh, talk about the scope of work involved in maintaining and stewarding foreign digital content, uh, so I will be going quite in depth. Uh, and then I'll talk about another collection of interest, which I hope will kind of tie up some loose ends and wrap up my talk. And then lastly, uh, I should have some time for questions. Okay, so here we go. So the Neil Marcus papers. Um, so the completion of the Neil Marcus papers was a real milestone for the Bancroft Library. It was the largest hybrid collection process to date. And in addition to the content that you see on this slide, there are 10 linear feet of manuscript and photographic material. Uh, his is truly a modern collection with YouTube video, Facebook data, and extensive file directories. Four archivists worked on this collection over the course of six years. Uh, Neil Marcus was born in 1954 and he recently died in 2021. He was a writer, uh, an actor, an artist, a dancer, and a, an activist in the disability rights and disability culture movements. He had dystonia, which is a neurological disorder that caused him to have involuntary muscle contractions, and it greatly affected his speech. Uh, and so he was also a prolific writer, and his autobiographical play, Storm Reading, was performed across the country for uh, roughly a decade. And the list of his accomplishments goes on and on. Um, in working with this collection, one of the things that really stood out to me was uh, his writings on communication, his, his desire to connect with individuals, and, uh, and the way that he used technology to do that. I, I was kind of, kind of fas fascinated by that. Uh, so, I'm going to start off by uh, going over some of the materials that I came across. Uh, email and instant messaging provided this kind of unique form of communication. He used email from 1988 
to July 1989 to document an interview he did with Mark O'Brien, who was a good friend of his. Uh, O'Brien uh, contracted polio at the age of six and spent much of his life in an iron lung. He was also uh, a disabilities advocate. He was a journalist, a poet, and a UC Berkeley alum uh, with a bachelor's and a master's degree from Berkeley. Uh, Marcus had an email account at well.com beginning in the early 80s, which I think is incredible, uh, which he learned about because Mark O'Brien had an account there as well. Uh, their email exchanges are intimate, humorous. I think it was an innovative approach to do an interview. And here's how it begins. I'm going to read this because it's great. He says, Dear Mark, I have always wanted to do an interview over the modem. This could be a first. It could get published. Let me ask a few questions. Later, I will splice your answers with my observations of society, disability, art, and pride. Here goes. Hi, where were you born? How old are you? Important turning points in your life? Any insights? Describe yourself. Um, they had a really amazing dialogue and a very vulnerable one where they talk about the disability movement and their thoughts on the word disability itself. Uh, they're incredibly candid with each other. Uh, and so he kept this and uh, researchers now have access to it. Uh, the other uh, piece of communication that came through that I thought was really interesting was this uh, instant message exchange. So in 2004, Esther Ehrlich of the Regional Oral History Office, which is now the Oral History Center of the Bancroft Library, conducted an oral history of Neil Marcus. And this was a transformative experience for him. They communicated through instant messaging on two computers placed side by side in the oral history office over six sessions and 16 hours. The last one Neil did from the comforts of his home in Berkeley. He kept those instant messages, and this is the end of the sixth session. And it ends with, Esther, this talk is amazing. It's like speaking for the first time in my life. Thank you. And after this experience, he went on to write um, several drafts of this essay uh, titled Speaking of Speaking. I'm going to skim this as I read it because it's fairly lengthy, but I think there's some important points to bring out. He says, um, I want to assume for now that I have not spoken for 50 years. That's how old I am, 50. I've not spoken because my speech has been physically very difficult due to my disability and because of the world I live in. It is very fast paced and impatient. It's not that I don't have things to say. I think I have a lot to say. It's just too frustrating. It's difficult. It's a pain. It's a struggle. It's tiring. It's not worth it, et cetera. In truth, I really do and can speak. In truth, too, it is frequently not very satisfying. I want to be asked complicated questions. I want to discuss complex ideas. I want to speak about all the things I write about. Isn't that how we know we really exist in the world through our use of language? And then he goes on to talk about how that experience was uh, in transformative, the one uh, where the oral history, uh, I'm sorry, the university asked him to tell his oral history. And he said, I couldn't pass this up. And as I thought about it more, I thought that we would communicate by writing back and forth, similar to speaking, but it gave me a lot more freedom than my voice could. And I would be on a more equal plane with my interviewer and wouldn't be constrained by feeling inadequate, slow, labored, and simplistic. He goes on to say that it, he really can't stop now. And he did go through a, a kind of a, a this explosion of writing after that. So I'm very excited to see how researchers will use this collection, the questions that they will ask, and the ways that they will connect to Neil Marcus and his writings and his legacy. Uh, so now that we have that, um, that collection in our mind, I'm going to dive deeper into our program. And I hope that you can think of Neil Marcus's thousands of files as we go through this to kind of orient yourself with the work. I'm gonna start by talking about some brief definitions of technical terms so that we're all on the same page. Um, I'm gonna start with born digital as opposed to digitized. So what does this born digital mean? It means 
This is content that's created natively in an electronic environment, email, websites, Word docs, you, the list goes on. I don't think there's an end to it. Um, so I don't scan in my unit. I'm not scanning anything. On occasion, donors or organization will they'll scan their records and it might come to us through hard drives, but that's usually not the focus of the collection and it doesn't happen um, as often. Um, most of the content that I get is born digital, is creative on a computer or some kind of electronic environment. Okay, media versus uh, materials. So when I talk about media, I'm talking about the disks, so like all, or the storage containers. So what you see at the bottom, that graphic, all those disks, that's the media. That's what I'm talking about. The media are not the archive. So now I'm gonna talk about materials. Materials are the archive. Materials are the files the databases, the photographs, the videos, that's that's the material. Those are the materials, that's the content we're after. The disks are just temporary storage containers that become obsolete. Not too dissimilar to the boxes that we receive analog materials in. We do keep our disks as a fail safe um, and we have had on occasion to go back to them. But on a whole, I do not consider the disks the actual archive. Okay. I'm going to talk about checksums because I talk about it in my talk. And I don't think that our community does a great job of describing checksum and emphasizing their importance. So checksums are a crucial part of digital preservation. Some people like to refer to them as thumbprints of a file. That's a good way of thinking about them. All they are are algorithms. Uh, they're special algorithms that are run against a file. So MD5 is an example of one. So let's think of Neil Marcus here. If I were to run a checksum on speaking of speaking, that essay we were just looking at, and I, I run this algorithm, it'll spit out a string of numbers. That's the checksum. And I save that number and I say, okay, great. Let's say I go back in that file and I say, mm, I think there's a typo. I don't think he meant it that way. Or maybe this period, maybe he needs a period here. And I add that period. That's the only change I make. And I save it. If I run that algorithm again, that checksum, that string of numbers will change. And when I go to validate that checksum to check it, it will fail. And I will know then that that file has been compromised. So that checksum helps me validate that the file is has integrity. And when I do this, I do this on the files on the disk, I do a checksum, when I move it to our working server, and then when I move it to deep storage. So all those checksums match. And I can, with confidence, tell researcher that that file has not been tampered with. And I think you can think of some examples where that would be a problem, right, if it was. And so that kind of ties into forensic. So forensic is the scientific analysis of physical evidence. That's, it's a methodology, it's a practice. And you might think of like uh, CSI or these like fancy shows. It's not quite like that, but I think you could think of some legal cases like Enron and maybe some other ones in the last few years that had to do with email where forensic practices were used to ensure that uh, the electronic records could be used as evidence. And so I, I borrow from that practice, and actually the digital archives community regularly does, to, so that we can ensure to researchers that they can cite these materials uh, with confidence that we do validate them, that we do in our digital preservation practices, we do this um, up to the best practices of our profession. Okay, that was a lot of information. Uh, now I'm going to kind of apply all of this. I don't think I need to belabor the point that the Bancroft has some very unique collections. Um, we've already talked about one of them, but how do these collections actually come to the Bancroft? How do we receive born digital content. And the truth is we receive it on all kinds of media. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just our big hitters. Um, so you can see three and a half inch floppy disks are very popular uh, and CDs are very quickly passing them. 
This makes a lot of sense. Three and a half inch floppy disks only hold 1.44 megabytes of storage space. That's not very much. When I tell that to students, they kind of laugh. Um, but if you're someone like Neil Marcus, if you're in that generation of storage, that's all you have, you're gonna need a lot of three and a half inch floppy disks. And it's not uncommon when I get a collection of an individual that it will have hundreds of three and a half inch floppy disks um, because that's that was the only available accessible storage for a generation. Now CDs are seven, 750 megabytes and that's much better, um, but in more CDs it's shifting and it won't be long before it will be cloud storage where I expect that most of our materials will be coming in through Google Drive, Dropbox, and a cloud system that hasn't even been built yet. So it's an ever evolving uh, field of formats and media, and now maybe lack of media. Uh, so I think these numbers are, I don't know, I nerd out on them. Okay, so how do you handle, um, oh, I should also say that there, are, we currently have 8,000 different individual media. And that's a number that is still growing. Um, but so how do you manage all of that? How do you manage this exploding content? Um, generations of software that are now obsolete, WordStar, WordPerfect, old access databases, Lotus Notes, Eudora email. Neil Marcus had something called CC Mail, which was a precursor to Lotus Notes. Uh, and it had to be migrated several times. Um, so my very low estimate of the materials that we've been able to extract is about 500,000 files, but that's uh, very incomplete. There are many that we have not extracted. Uh, we have over seven terabytes of space on our server, and I think that's also a very conservative number. So managing that volume of material, like any other program, requires a robust, adaptive program that's rooted in best practices. And this is how I approach this work. These are foundational archival principles. They are the different phases of the collection, each requiring its own documented workflow. And I'll go through each of the pieces of the pie uh, to discuss how I approach each of these phases. Okay. So what are we preserving and why? That's like, it's almost an, uh, it, I know that seems abstract, but it's, it's not. Um, there are many factors that go into answering that question. And it's a very important question. It's the most important question, I believe, uh, in dealing with the collections because of the volume that we're working with. The most important factor is really the Bancroft collection policy. Our curators implement this. So they really kind of lead the charge on the what we are preserving and the why. And so they can articulate that they're the ones who are rounding out different collections at the Bancroft or collecting areas. Um, the other factor that comes in are privacy and PII, being personally identifying information. We typically do not want uh, those kinds of materials. It really depends on the collection, unless there's a very compelling reason why, but scans of people's um, driver's license and passports, those are not typically things that we collect. Um, and formats, that we, it's pretty rare, but every now and then there's a format that we simply cannot take. And I think that's becoming more of an issue actually within our profession. So most formats we can do okay, or we know someone who can help us with that. And I'll talk more about that later, but um, formats can sometimes be another issue and volume to be honest. Um, and lastly, I wanna talk about preservation intent this was a concept out of uh, Trevor Owen's uh, The Theory and Craft of Digital Preservation. And it's, it's a very, it seems abstract, um, but it is the what. It's a very specific, the what you are preserving. And my last collection that I'll be talking about really answers that question. And so I will, I will kind of circle back to that concept. Okay. So the realities of implementing this. Um, so this is perhaps the most labor intensive phase. I, I'm not gonna go into this diagram. This is just for, this is just the workflow for my students. We've been able to scale up this work to students. 
and they're fantastic. We've accessioned more discs, more media this last fiscal year than we ever have. And I do credit our students to that. Um, it's This is only to demonstrate that each phase has what we often refer to as invisible labor, which I'm hoping through this talk will make more visible. This is actually the extended first half of this workflow. So this work requires com complex technical environments with both hardware and software that can support this work. This phase deals with collection management, inventory management, generating metadata for collections, like those checksums. We, this is when we do that. We also do directory listings. So all the disks that Neil Marcus gave us all have directory listings and checksums of those files. And this phase also deals heavily with extracting files off of the media. It is a labor intensive process. Um, and as you can see, this requires a documented workflow where roles and responsibilities are defined. I am a big believer in workflows that are diagrammed out. I think it's helpful for accountability for myself. And I'm just visually better able to understand the process. So I have these for all phases of our work. All right. So what does this actually like mean, right? So again, what I'm talking about is extracting obsolete file types from obsolete media. It isn't magic. It requires several different drives. We have, this is our five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Uh, we also rely closely on our close network of professional. There are not many digital archivists and we work together to share practices and sometimes equipment. So if I only have one eight inch floppy disk, yeah, I have an eight inch floppy disk. It might make more sense for me to go somewhere that has one, a, you know, so another digital archivist than for me to purchase that disk drive. And conversely, practitioners have come to us to use our equipment with their legacy media. When we have three and a half inch floppy drives, zip drives, I'm working on a Cyclest disk drive, but this five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive is my favorite to show students because this is, I tell them my first video game was on this format and I, it was where in the world was Carmen San Diego and it had like five discs. And they all kind of look at me like, really? <laughs> and they are just kind of shocked. And, but they get to like physically handle these materials, use the drive, see how it works. And I think it's such a fun experience for them to work with this legacy media. Uh, so I, I enjoy that part of our training. Uh, okay. So normalization and stabilizing the files, that's also part of this phase. It's the process of migrating file types from an obsolete format to an industry standard stable file type. So you might think of that Neil Marcus essay in a word star document, I would need to migrate it to a PDF to stabilize it. Um, that is also very time, uh, uh, takes a fair amount of time. Uh, we do retain the originals and we have software that allows you to see the files as they were intended because sometimes when you migrate it, it loses its formatting. It's not the way it was meant to be seen. So I think the profession has really made some strong headway in emulation, which is the ability to see these files as they were intended. And I think we're moving in that direction. And so hopefully we won't have to do this labor intensive part of it, but um, but that is still in transition in the profession for sure. Okay. So to accomplish this, we rely on a grab bag of tools and I lean heavily on my colleagues. I have to do a big shout out to the Bancroft Technical Services who I work very closely actually in all of these phases. Um, but the we do use forensic tools. Many of the programs we use for this work don't have logos. They're simply scripts developed to resolve individual use cases like Neil Marcus's CC mail, which did have to get migrated three times to get to inbox, which is the standard for email. Um, we also rely on library IT to support a couple of these programs and the, for the storage of, for our files. Okay, so now that was a very big piece of the pie. The next few, we'll 
will go faster. Um, again, this is the invisible, now visible work of processing a collection. Processing digital materials has some overlap with analog materials, but there are clearly unique issues. Arranging and describing a collection is the backbone of archival processing. It is the intellectual arrangement of a collection into a record, usually a finding aid or a catalog record. But all the things that go before that, I think sometimes are invisible. Um, so how does this work though, when you have a directory of files, sometimes thousands of files, like in the Neil Marcus collection? To me, this is the most fascinating part of this work because it's evolving. Um, the truth is if the creator has already arranged their work in a meaningful way, there isn't much to do on my end. It becomes easier. But sometimes we do need to provide a system of intellectual arrangement so that researchers can find materials in context. My Google Photos is a good example of what that looks like when you don't actually arrange it. Um, it can be very difficult to find things. Uh, we do use descriptive best practices to describe our materials. And during processing, uh, my concerns have a lot to do with my legal and ethical responsibility surrounding personally identifying information and privacy concerns. And I'll give you some examples. So, and it's this is why we like to talk to donors about this ahead of time, because it's a lot harder in this phase of the project to find these materials. So if you do have a scan, let's say Neil Marcus had a scan of his passport in here and the file name is img underscore one, two, three, four dot JPEG. There is no text search or character pattern search that's going to find that, that scan, that JPEG. Um, so if we do find one randomly when we're looking at files, it kind of flags the collection and we have to look at it more closely because it has this privacy information. Um, now, I mentioned Google Photos, and I know that if in, Google, in Google Photos, you can actually search for a passport or a driver's license, but I'm not going to upload thousands of files into Google Photos. So the technology exists, the AI technology exists to find those kinds of problematic materials. They just haven't made their way to our profession. Like that's a whole other scope of work. But I hope that in my working lifetime that those tools will be available to us and those developments will trickle down to our work uh, where they're so greatly needed. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So levels of access. Um, so now we're really getting towards the end of our pie here. Um, so I worked closely with Susan McElrath from Public Services, Randy Brandt and Lara Michaels and Mary Aileen from the Bancroft Technical Services. And we implemented a workflow to provide access to born digital content for the first time. So now our new Marcus papers, it's gone through this, these phases, it's been arranged and described, the finding aid is up. Now researchers can uh, ask to see it. While this work is still evolving, we do have collections queued in TIND, our digital collections portal, and that's that's something we're still exploring. But the truth is there's some collections due to copyright and other issues uh, are best served in the reading room, or we also use box.com as kind of a middle ground of the two. Um, for our collections with limited access, researchers can use finding aids or catalog records to request materials, which can then be served in the reading room or on box.com. And if anybody has used our Aon request form, you're probably familiar with this screen. And so now you should be able to request digital folders, which we'll get back to you on how to view them. Um, for our collections where um, we want people to see the entire collection, uh, we need to find cleaner ways for researchers to see this. And it can be really cumbersome to use directory listings. We also don't describe every file, neither analog nor digital. We don't describe every single item. Um, so we're trying to look into more user-friendly browsing tools to help researchers find materials that are of interest for their research. So this is an example of one of those tools that you can kind of dig into the collection to try to find what's in there and um, drill down to actually into the file level. 
Um, so that's, I, I'm not going to talk about managing copies, which is the last piece of this pie. And the reason why is because that's our library IT does that. I think sometimes their work is invisible too. Um, but they do manage our, our copies. They, they do our digital preservation end of things, the very end of that cycle of our deep storage. So they run our servers. Digital preservation, and I, I should have mentioned it in the beginning, is really part of each of these phases. That checksum, the metadata, the extracting of the files, uh, the migration of those files to stable formats, all of that, uh, all of those components are part of a larger digital preservation strategy. It is baked into every phase. Sometimes we only think of it as that final storage, that final server that it goes to. I think it's that it's critical that it's baked into every phase. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about Blockly University because I think it's it kind of wraps up some of these concepts in an interesting way. So if you're unfamiliar, Blockly University was a student-led project in which students built a replica of the Berkeley campus in the video game Minecraft. It's a faithful replica and they held their commencement there during the 2020 uh, COVID pandemic. They, um, they actually held it there again, I think in 2021. But they built this during the pandemic. It was a very interesting response. But a little bit about Minecraft. So Minecraft is a sandbox video game, which means there's no agenda. Your experience is the game. It allows players to create their own world with blocks and it can be whatever you want it to be. If you want zombies and creepers that blow things up, um, you can do that. Or it could be a creative, peaceful space. Um, it is one of the most successful video games of all time with 200, over 200 million copies sold um, and over 140 million monthly active users in 2021. So what is Blockly University? So I, I think it's best for the students who built Blockly to best describe what Blockly is. So I'm going to let that happen. Six counties in the San Francisco Bay Area. and maintain social distancing. Place. At least in San Francisco will require people to stay home except for essential needs. She's to let New Order play because it's New Order, you know, and they chose that. I, I thought that was amazing. So when I saw that video, I was in the shelter in place, like most of you, 
working with my kids and my dog and my husband. And it was a really crazy time. And I really missed the campus. And I got so excited when I saw that video because I play Minecraft. And I know that each block represents three feet. So to build a faithful replica of the campus in that short amount of time was no small feat. It was a very organized uh, event or a series of building days. Um, and, and I found out that Carol Chris was also supportive of the project and she was going to be involved with the commencement among other administrators. Uh, so it was clearly a really unique response to the pandemic. Other campuses from other universities have been built in Minecraft, but this was very specifically in response to the pandemic as a way for students to build community. Um, and I reached out to Kathy Neal, university archivist. And she was really excited by this too. She had already seen the video and she supported the idea of documenting Blockley University project uh, for our university archives. Um, it was an unusual student experience to document to say the least. Um, and it was touching and, and it was a creative way for students to maintain a sense of community during the shutdown and to preserve this milestone moment which was their commencement. Like we can all think of our own commencements if you've gone through one or a special occasion in which your family has maybe sacrificed for you to get to whatever milestone that was. Um, and I had students talk about that to me and it was um, very touching. So how do we go about this? So I, I did a lot of research. We talked to the students and I said, in the past, Video games have been preserved by someone screen casting, someone walking through the video game. And they said, no, that's not the way we can preserve Blockly. That's not going to work. And um, I was kind of glad that they pushed back a little bit because um, I agree with them. The preservation intent, back to that slide, the preservation intent is your own experience in this space. That is what you are preserving. And I understand that. And I, but I did tell them, I said, I cannot um, preserve a Minecraft server in perpetuity. That's not sustainable. And they understood that too. So they came up with this perfect solution. They created a bit by bit copy in a world map. It's a world, a Minecraft world, which you can upload into any Minecraft video game installation that you have. It makes it portable. Um, and it's not a giant space hog. I thought it was going to be bigger, but it's it's not huge. It's very manageable. So we did that and we have that along with all their planning documents that they created in Google Drive. And we did this all remotely. Uh, it was still during the shutdown. So there were no external hard drives to exchange, no flash drives. And it made us sharpen our skills to do this remote work as well. And we, I think we really built on our practice because of this project. And I'm really grateful to them for that. So um, since then, the students have created their own formal campus organization. We still re receive COVID-19 emails, pandemic emails, and we preserve those too. We preserve the ways the campus is responding to the pandemic. Um, so the last thing I wanna say about Blockly is one of my favorite pieces of this collection is a YouTube video that a student created as a tour of the campus for prospective students. So she used Blockly, she walked through it because she couldn't go to campus and she recorded a tour uh, for, for incoming students. I thought that was so cool and unique and um, just a great use of it. So that's also part of the collection. Uh, so again, I'm really excited to have been able to share about um, our collections. And uh, that wraps up my talk. I, I hope I covered as much as I could in that time span, but I'm really looking forward to your questions about this work. Uh, and thank you again for your interest. Wow, Christina, thank you so much. That was, that was wonderful. Um, as, as we mentioned at the, at the top, top of the hour, if you could either uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself to ask Christina a question directly, 
please do so. You could also leave a question in the chat and we can ask that for you. So we'd like to open it up for questions or comments for Christina. Okay, we have a question here from Anne. She's asking, are you developing checklists or best practices for researchers who are getting started using a digital collection? Yeah, we have um, created some guides with how to do that and we share those when they request them. Um, but I think creating actually um, a lib guide for something like that would be also very helpful if that's kind of what you're thinking. And if that's not what you're thinking, thank you for that idea. <laughs> Even though <laughs> it's not explicit. Um, I do think that we should promote these materials more with researchers, or at least make them aware that they exist. Um, they can they can get a little buried sometimes. And um, oh, thank you. Thank you for posting the OAC uh, finding aid for Neil Marcus. Thanks, Anne. Oh, we have another question here from Johan who says, in conventional archives, you have this wear and tear aspect of materials, preserved things, show signs of prior use, and sometimes um, other evidence from having been handled in different collections, et cetera. So I assume he's perhaps asking how, what is the difference in a, in a digital archive? Sure, so I um, I wouldn't wanna give a researcher a file that has been annotated by another researcher. Um, we like to give the researcher the, the you know, again, the, the ability to cite evidence with confidence. That's always like in the back of my mind. So the file I give you is going to be a bit by bit copy of what we've preserved. Um, so it doesn't show signs of wear and tear. What maybe shows signs of its age are going to be things like its font, its formatting. Um, I see a lot of, um, remember those chain emails in those early days of email? You see those in people's collections, uh, these old chain mails. So I think it's the content itself that reflects the time period. Um, but no, you don't get the same wear and tear, the leathery feeling. And when I, I think about that sometimes with my students, when they work with those floppy disks, it's not the same as holding a gold rush letter. I'm very well aware of that, but I still think it's a connection to the past. And especially in the Bay Area, I think it's a this connection to our technical history, I think is really interesting. And I think they value that too, regardless of their background, like what their, um, field of study is. I have all kinds, they're not all computer science majors. Um, and so I appreciate their curiosity with this material also. Anyway, a few questions have come in through the chat, Christina. So we'll start with this one from David DiLorenzo. Once you have moved files to the preservation repository, do you still retain the original physical media? So we currently are. Um, and again, that's as a fail safe. I'd like to think that at some point we wouldn't need to do that. Um, I don't know a lot of institutions who are throwing them out. Um, it, I think there is this um, vulnerability with digital, right? You're only as safe as your servers. So we do hold on to them just for good measure. And they don't take up an extraordinary amount of space for now. So yes, we do keep the originals. The next question comes from Kim Bancroft, who asks, this might be a question for Christina, but also the non-digital archivists. Um, is there any preference for getting non-digital archives, given what seems like the complexity of trying to transform the digital in all its forms and the sometimes humongous items involved? Uh, I would say that we don't dissuade from either one. Um, I think that they all have value to them and research value. So I think it really depends on the material itself. And um, I would love for the curators too to jump in if they have something to add. 
Yeah, I, I I would just agree with you on that one, Christina. Mm -hmm. That we it depends on it depends on the um, the items themselves, and sometimes they're digital, and sometimes they're analog, and we need to work with what the donor has. And we're starting to see material in both, right? So we're starting to get some where there is an analog component, but there's a lot of digital components now. Especially, I think you know, as as people were moving to 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 email and everything else that they were preserving. So yeah, we're, we're kind of bringing in both. I would also say that if you're not collecting digital, you're not documenting contemporary communities. And in a hundred years, you won't have any documentation <laughs> of the communities here. So we'll be stuck. Our documentation will be stuck in the past. And you can make a decision like that. There are some libraries who only collect, collect up to a certain point in time but it's a it has to be a, de a deliberate collecting policy decision i think yeah. uh zachary you have your hand up would you like to unmute yourself yes hello i manage an archive for indigenous language materials here in the linguistics department on campus and we deal a lot with um linguists and other people creating born digital audio visual materials that can be quite large in file size you know high definition video and things like that and i'm just wondering what your total sort of digital storage capacity is right now it's not uncommon for us for example to you know get a message from someone saying um i just spent a summer creating you know a terabyte and a half of high definition video can you intake that so that's sort of the spirit behind the question I think that's such a, an important question. I don't think we talk enough about the infrastructure required to do this work. As, as a digital archivist and, and Kathy Neal, the university archivist, for example, we're required to take in our university records. We require an infrastructure to support that work. I don't know our storage, but I do try to be mindful. Our library IT folks are great and they manage our storage. If I have a huge incoming collection, I loop them in. I just recently did that. And I said, you know, we have 40,000 high, you know, these are big files. Do we have the storage for that? And we have to think about storage for born digital, I think in a very different way than we do physical space. And it needs to, we need that kind of support. Our library IT needs that support, right? They support our work. Um, so I think that's, a, I, don't, that, I know that's not a perfect answer to your question. I think it raises a lot more questions. It's a complicated question, and it has to do with university resources. And it's not big and flashy. Storage is not like this big flashy collection, right? Like it's not this exciting thing, but it's very crucial to our work. It's very exciting to you, and it's exciting to me. Um, so I think we, having talks like this is really important. And I would love to learn more about your collections uh, because it does raise awareness of these kind of gaps in our infrastructure, right? Where we so desperately need storage if we want to steward these collections. And in my case, and maybe your case, like we're mandated to steward them. So we have to support the work. Thank you for that question. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, going back to some of the chat questions, here's one from Kat. Uh, apologies if I missed this detail, but how are you providing access to the converted emails in your collections? Is it through EPAD or another tool? So we are invested in EPAD. Um, we don't have a collection up yet. I'm hoping actually that our COVID-19 collection will be the first one because it's our campus communications it's, it doesn't have privacy issues. It's a very straightforward collection. Um, it hasn't ended, like I said yet though, um, but we do use EPAD to appraise our email collections. Um, and the truth is a lot of email has a lot of privacy issues and, um, and some ethical questions. So uh, I think I love EPAD in that it gives us ways to find that material and to kind of ask these questions, but that is the tool that we use for email. Great. And another question from Sterling. Uh, I know that donated analog audio materials kind of go into a black hole because there aren't the resources to digitize them. Could curators encourage donors to take responsibility for providing digital files and analog materials themselves prior to donation whenever possible? Um, is that a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> 
I know in some cases we do receive them that way, but um, but often we don't. I think it's a big lift for anyone, donor or curator, but I'm gonna let other folks jump into that question. I mean, we have, I've, I've certainly spoken with donors who had material, um, a donor had some some film from um, Diego Rivera in the 30s um, that um, a great uncle of, them of theirs had had um had um taken you know in, in film when when they were in Mexico and um yeah they they were hoping to donate and we asked and they did find a way to to get that material digitized um and so I think it when it does come in it will come in as as both the the analog material so that we can preserve that because I think that's important but it will have a digital component because they have done that but you know that that is a cost um that I think a lot of folks um, who, who are giving us things often um, haven't really taken into um, into account when when they're making that donation. So. Yeah, and I would just add, we do yes, we we try and work with people when we can when that's when that's a possibility, but sometimes it just is not. So yeah. it's certainly a mixed bag. Um, I'd like to get to another question here from Claire. Looking forward, how do you anticipate saving obsolete media in twenty one twenty three? When the original version is from 1985, the equipment will get scarcer. Yeah, that's true. And um, it's hard to think about 2123. Um, <laughs> we do have the Computer History Museum. So I don't preserve software typically. Like sometimes a collection will come with Microsoft installation disks. We don't keep those. Um, that's not within our purview. But there are institutions that do, like the Computer History Museum. Um, so we, we can't, I don't think every special collection intends to collect everything. Um, you have to have this collection scope, right? This collection policy. And we rely on our other institutions to kind of build up these collections too. So, um, I, but, but in 21, 23, will we have a drive for, you know, a three and a half inch floppy disk? My hope is that we do because the technology we'll have then is going to be much more complicated, right? It already is. So, it's, but you're right that the pieces, the 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 hardware is going to be difficult. Um, so, I I think we can only do the best we can now to preserve this material and um, keep pushing the profession forward. That would be my answer to that. Uh, we have some kind of comments and we just have a few more minutes here. Um, so I invite people to look at the chat for some of those. Um, here's a question. I see that you integrated the born digital files with the analog in the Marcus finding aid. You don't do that with photos. So I'm wondering why you decided not to make a separate finding aid for the BD files. Born digital. Born, sorry. <laughs> right. Born so digital files. When you talk about photos, I assume you're talking about pick collections. Um, David. So I don't see the digital as its own separate collection. I, I think we see them as hybrid collections um, where the materials should be accessed in context to each other. Um, it's a conceptual difference in viewing these collections. I think at one point the Born Digital community was often transferring them to its own unit and describing them separately. But since then we've really moved away from that practice and understood the value of describing them as hybrid collections because people don't work that way either, right? We we are living in digital analog all the time. We don't have separate lives for them. So, um, so I think it makes sense for researchers to access that individual's experience, that organization's records, all as a one collection. Um, I think it just provides more context to the material. So that's that's the framework. That's kind of the underpinning concept in, in describing them together as hybrid. Um, a follow-up to the digitization of analog media question. Um, Paul notes that it's definitely useful if digitized to an archival quality, but donors need to be made aware of those standards if that's chosen and as, as an option. And, and Zachary agrees and says it would, you know, to underscore the expense potentially, $100 a tape, um, if not more, is, is one of the costs of that. <clears throat> resources. <laughs> yeah, well, I, resources. these have been great questions. Thank you so much. 
Yeah. Thank you everyone for, for being here, for sticking with us for this, your lunch hour. Um, I think uh, there were some fantastic questions. Thank you so much, Christina, for, for doing this. I think we were really all looking forward to it. Um, so it's, it, this was, this was really wonderful. Um, and we'll see you all in April for the next one. Take care. Yeah, the next talk will be by Kim Bancroft talking about her latest book. So we hope to see a lot of you there. Thank you so much, Christina. And thank you everyone for thank joining you. us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.